Hey guys, it's Lana and welcome back for another episode of Seeing Other People. We are talking about some of my favorite topics today and some of your favorite topics like dating anxiety. If you didn't know that dating anxiety is a thing, where have you been? What, what, what dating world are you dating in? Because I don't know, unfamiliar unclear. Um, Today, we have Hillary Weinstein coming on the show. She is a therapist. She owns her own mental health practice called HLW Therapy. I don't know why I said practice like I am a valley girl because I am not, but um, we all have our moments. Hillary is so awesome. I've been following her on Instagram for so long, like at least like a year or two now, and I love everything she has to say. She does a lot of work with dating anxiety, relationships, self-esteem, body image issues, a lot, or the majority of her clientele is um, like 20 to 35 year old women who are struggling with all of those things. And I know I fit into a lot of those categories. And so do so many of you guys based on everything I know about the people who listen to seeing other people. And I know a lot about you so much so much more than you think. No, not really. I'm not creepy. Um, But Hillary is so awesome. And her her practice is also accepting new patients. So if you love what she has to say, definitely check out hlwtherapy.com. She seriously is so amazing. And we just really see the world in such a similar way. And um, I love you guys are gonna hear some amazing pieces of advice and just hot takes from her dad, Larry Weinstein throughout the episode. And Larry, Really big fan right now. Big fan. Um, This is great. We do a lot of listener questions and I'm super excited. So I am not going to, you know, keep going on. I'm just going to get right into it. Let's do it. Thanks to Athletic Greens for sponsoring this episode. I am so excited to tell you about their product, AG1, that I now use every day. I could not believe it when I heard that one product would support my gut health, my nervous system, my immune system, my recovery, my focus, and my aging all at the same time. So I tried it out a few months ago and I literally have not looked back. So what is it? AG1 is a powder supplement. With one scoop, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. It's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. And it supports better sleep quality and recovery along with mental clarity and alertness. It costs you less than $3 a day and you're investing in your health. Plus, it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. And yes, it tastes delicious. I sometimes actually sneak in a second serving later in the day because I literally like the taste of it that much. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash SOP. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash SOP to take ownership over your health and pick up your ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And we are here in the episode, Hillary Weinstein, welcome to Seeing Other People. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and talking with you. I'm so excited. I feel like this is a long time coming where like I've just stalked you on Instagram from afar for a very, very long time. So I'm thrilled to finally have you here. Vice versa. I feel like I know you from like just years of following you and like DMing like memes or reposting your (laughs) stories. Exactly. Well, so excited for this episode. I think it's one that a lot of people are really going to learn a lot and and benefit a lot from hearing this conversation. Before we kick things off and get into all the fun dating anxiety and all that stuff, um, could you just tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are now? You know, you have your own therapy practice, you're working with women who are, you know, navigating dating anxiety and self esteem and body image issues. How did you get started in this field? Yeah. Um, I was one of those weird ones that just like really early on, like in high school, um, I think I took a psychology course in like, like sophomore year or something and was just fascinated probably because I identified with a lot of what was talked about and was like, Oh, I'm going to fix myself. I'm going to, take this one psychology class sophomore year of high school at like 16 and I'll be good for the rest of my life. Um, And then fast forward, I'm here. Um, So I did not actually figure out on my own um, all of the reasons why my brain does certain things. I just finally realized I needed therapy. 
Um, and then that was a really good experience for me. And I was like, I, I want to do this. This is, I love the human brain. I love why people do what they do or the discrepancies, especially. And I see a lot in my practice now of, or even just like with friends of like how people think of themselves and how wildly different that is from like how I view them or, and Mm -hmm. I'm sure vice versa, how I think of myself versus how a good friend would think of me. Um, so I don't know. I just find all that stuff fascinating. So I figured I would make that my career and all my time. I love that. And I really like how you pointed out that you like, thought you could kind of fix yourself, but then realized like, no, like I should also go to therapy. Like I can't. Oh, I, I fully did. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll just read like a textbook and I'm good. Like, it's no. funny that you say that because so um, to everyone listening offline, I was just telling Hillary about how um, I've had a lot of health issues going on lately and my insurance coverage ended and I had to pick a new plan. And now I'm in this shitty situation where literally zero of my doctors that I've seen for years accept my new insurance plan. And it was I didn't have any other options. Like there were no other options that of plans that they accepted. And so now, you know, I recently, like earlier this year, I started with a new therapist that I love and I'm gaining so much from our sessions. And now it's like a few hundred dollars out of pocket for self pay each session. And I'm like, shit, like I can't afford to do that right now, but like, I want to keep going, but I don't know, like maybe I can just, you know, read and and listen to <laughs> podcasts from therapists and fix myself. I'm like, no, on like, I know I can't do that. I have to figure something out. But um, it really is so true. And, and talking to somebody and, and somebody with that expertise about what's going on, like, it's something that there's, there's no replacement for it. There really isn't. I mean, uh, I'm a therapist, I have 12 plus years of experience. And I feel like I I mean, I feel like I do a pretty good job helping other people, but when it comes to myself, I'm shit out of luck. I mean, like you just, we all have our own biases and you just, that's not going to go away. So I, I see a therapist. I've been seeing the same therapist since I was like 19. Yeah. I love that. And I love thinking about like the fact that therapists like also go to therapy and it's like teachers also were taught by other teachers and (laughs) everyone who's doing something like learned it from somebody else. So it's the circle of life, if you will. Right. No one came out of the womb with whatever skills they have. And that doesn't mean they could apply it to themselves. Exactly. So tell me about the type of clientele that you have. Like, are what are they going through? What are some themes that you're seeing? And what does it seem like the majority of people are struggling with if there are any common themes in those conversations? Yeah, so the majority of... So right now, I started my practice just in 2018 after working in hospitals and other uh, clinicians' practices. And... Then I started my practice and it was just me. And then um, demand increased and and COVID hit and demand really increased. Um, So now I have a team of therapists and still expanding. Um, And it's interesting that the clientele that I see and the demand, um, it really crosses over to the clients that my, the therapists who work with me see as well but 90 percent female um ranging from like 18 to 35 struggling with self-esteem is the main core issue and we try to understand like the origins of that like psychodynamically with the family and then like the messages they learned about themselves on top of everything that society piled on Um, and then how all of that manifests in different areas of their life, whether that's, as you said, like dating relationships, breakups, body image, comparison, timelines, like thinking they're less than if they're not on the same timeline with friends, all of that. That's, that's a huge bulk of what I and the therapists on my team talk about every day. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't struggle with their self-esteem at some point or another. And I feel like that's something that I hear about a lot from listeners, you know, especially when it comes to dating. And it's so difficult. I have one of my like closest friends right now, she's really struggling with 
dating and dating apps and she's not having a positive experience on them. And, you know, she, I have encouraged her to like try giving a chance to people that she does get matches with and does get like incoming likes from, cause you never know, like maybe they don't look like, or look like on paper, what she has in mind for her future partner, but maybe they'd surprise her. And she has pushed herself. She has given chances to people that she wouldn't normally be into. And even with doing that, she's not making connections. She's going on dates and they're not good dates and she's not having any positive experiences. And so she's recently come to me saying like, she's just feeling so down about herself and about dating. And I know that she feels like there's something wrong with her because she can't have these positive experiences and she so badly wants to find somebody to connect with and can't. And it's so difficult. So I'm wondering if you have any advice for anyone in a situation like that, who really is trying and they're putting themselves out there and they kind of keep just getting knocked down by the dating world. If you are anything like me and you are going on a date, you're probably like nervous, but also excited, but just like really want to have a good time. Don't want to screw anything up. And you get like the pre-date jitters. Um, for me, there were two things that I would do to help with those pre-date jitters. I would always call a friend for a little pump up speech. And I would also take a happy gummy from Mindset Wellness CBD before my date. It would help me stay in the right mood, being excited, being present, but it would also take away that layer of nerves that was going to stop me from being my best self on the date. I love the happy gummies. They are incredible. They taste great. They don't make you feel high or anything like that. They just make you feel like the best version of yourself. So try them today. Definitely recommend trying them before a date. Mindsetwellnesscbd.com. Use code seeing other people at checkout. That will get you 20% off and free shipping. Yeah. I mean, the thing that stands out to me the most about how you just phrased that, because it's a very common experience and I've been there myself for years and years at a time, um, is that the dating culture is failing your friend and she's personalizing that to something being wrong with her when it takes two people to have a match and have chemistry and have all the things that make a relationship work or make you want to go on a second, third, fourth date, be exclusive, whatever. And have you heard, um, Logan from the Logan Hinge. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like she's been on your podcast before. Yes. Or yep. Yeah, and her whole shtick of not shtick that sounds <laughs> minimizing. It's a very it's real data. Um, that's just the Jew in me. Um, but her whole platform of how dating apps are, especially in New York City, are really skewed against young women and it's so much in favor of men um i mean if i'm misremembering that or exactly how she phrased it she would phrase it way better um mm. but that i think it's like 80 percent of men have that like fall under the categories of what a lot of women in that age range are looking for have their what they're looking for encompasses like all of those women right i'm not making a lot of sense right now but my point being is it's skewed again it is majorly skewed against women and even if that wasn't the case if it if dating apps aren't working dating apps are hard and dating is difficult then the conclusion that it's something wrong with her speaks more to something that she, she might be internally struggling with because it, it can't possibly be all one person. Yeah. I remember I had a conversation with my dad and he's very pragmatic and analytical. And this was, I think I was like 25 or something and I was just striking out and no dates were like connecting either. I liked them. They didn't like me. I didn't like them. They liked me or no one liked each other. And I kind of broke down to my dad and I was like, what, like, what is wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? And like, 
God forbid I have a day where like, I think I'm a catch to some extent or another. And then I feel like I'm proven wrong every time I go on a date. And my dad's response is, okay, well, how many dates have you, what are you referencing? How many dates have you gone on in the last, whatever, let's say month? And I was like, um, like five. And he's like, and you're concluding from five dates that there's something wrong with you and like you're unlovable and like you're never going to find anyone you're going to die alone and I was like yes that's five people dad and he's like yes that's five people Hillary and he's like you need to cast a way wider net like you it come to me after you've dated a hundred people and not one has you've had a connection with then like yeah maybe we should evaluate what's what's going on if you're doing anything or if like your defenses are getting in the way or whatever but like are you kidding and I see that a lot in my practice with like someone coming and saying like oh like I've been on the past three dates I've been rejected so now I just want to delete all the dating apps and I'm like well I mean it's only three dates and like that's a very small number to conclude a very big thing about yourself. Yeah. I love that example um, that you mentioned with your dad. Sorry not to cut you off. Um, I think it really is so true and something that so many people have experienced and, and just jump to that conclusion when in reality, it's like, you know, if you were to go through your phone and pick out three people randomly from your contacts list, like, that you know, you might not necessarily like, what are the chances that you're going to connect with those people, you know? And it's like, there are millions of people in the world. Of course, once you put, you know, all your filters on and age range and distance and stuff, there aren't millions of options, but there are so many options out there and you're not going to like all of those people either. Yeah. And if you did, I would argue that's probably a pretty objective clinical problem like love is celebrated and there are weddings and thousands of dollars spent on everyone attending celebration of love because it's rare so we want something rare and special but then we get upset when after three or five dates we don't get what we want that's not rare yeah Completely. So switching gears a bit, I want to talk about dating anxiety. And this is something that I constantly see, um, you know, therapists or other people and dating coaches, people in the dating space recommending for people who have a lot of dating anxiety. And I'm really curious what your thoughts are on it. Because I know for me, I was the most anxious dater ever. And like, I don't think a single one of my friends even compared to the amount of like dating anxiety that I had. And I was not very good at dating multiple people at a time, but I see that that is a suggestion for people who have dating anxiety where, so that they don't get like so caught up on hyper-focused and overthinking one person, you know, they're kind of like pushed to go out with multiple people so that they can have their kind of focus spread to different parts and not be like hyper fixated on one person. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Because, you know, from my perspective, I think there are people who can do that. And there are people that I see, like I have, you know, friends and listeners who have come to me sharing their experiences. And I think they're actually doing themselves a disservice by doing that. I couldn't agree more. And whether it's friends who have come to me, or I mean, I absolutely did that, like, anxious attachment is my love language. I mean, not, <laughs> not anymore, thankfully, but it was in the peak of my dating. Um, so I personally can understand and empathize with that a lot. But um, I think there's a lot to be said about how much we all like, especially females were so much we're so wired for connection. And we're also very wired for comparison. So putting the two things together, um, is there's this pressure to feel like you are as good as your friends, as accomplished as your friends, as successful as your friends, if you are deemed someone who is worthy of a loving relationship, a healthy relationship. And 
I think we also tend to romanticize the opportunity of something that seems hopeful, but you could date a bunch of people that have characteristics that make you hopeful, but then they lack a lot of characteristics that mean inevitably that plane wouldn't land. That wouldn't be a successful relationship. So I think that dating just one person is putting all the eggs in that basket and kind of putting all of that fixation and hope and romanticizing and fear of like catastrophe of ending up alone on this one person. And then that's, even if it is a match that in itself could blow it up. Yeah. I, I see that side of it. I really do. Cause I've been completely in that position before where you know, I really was banking on this person, I thought it was going to work out. And then when it didn't, I'm like, great, like, again, I found this like really great connections, really great person. And, you know, they're perfect on paper and in real life. And they said they liked me and wanted to be with me. And then why did this not work out again? Um, But and and on, on kind of to the point of why it's a suggested thing, like, when I met uh, my now boyfriend, Jake, I was able to recognize how comfortable I felt with him because of the way he was communicating with me versus the other guy I'd gone out on a few dates with that I was obsessing over because of how anxious I was because he was not communicating with me. So that was like a really cool thing to see. But at the same time, I feel like if you're dating, like let's say you go on three first dates in one week, how can Mm -hmm. you really actually digest like what happened on each day and assess that chemistry and you know just like continue to to see those things through and give them a fair shot like because I feel like it that's so much energy and so much of you like being exhausted from each experience yes it is so much energy but it's also something that like in these examples of I don't want to overgeneralize and say everyone, but in these examples of people who really want a relationship, that's a top priority. They really want it. And just like if they really wanted a job position, they would put a lot of time and energy into it. And I think oftentimes people, because of fear of getting rejected or something not working out, tend to shift their time and energy to other things, to overexerting themselves past the point of their duties at work or with friends or being the supportive friend or whatever it is where if it was really in line with their priorities, that time and energy would go to really sitting down and, and taking some time and space to analyze mm-hmm. like what you like or dislike about the three different first dates you went on. And like, yeah, it's exhausting, but I, it does kind of take away all that pressure of it being on one person that that's a I really appreciate that you said that and I think that is kind of the way to go about it where like it's okay to be doing that but you have to make sure that you're not just going on the date and then looking to the next date like you have to go on the date and then reflect on it and think about how you felt with that person and and digest it and then go on the next date and do the same thing so I think that is really important and kind of the only way for that to actually work. Yeah. I also think it's really important for whether, I mean, I'm biased. So I think that this is best achieved in therapy, but to understand where you're coming from, because oftentimes dating, it can feel very, I mean, it is performative in a sense. And it's like each person is auditioning and that can create a lot of insecurities. And if you feel, if you're going on dates with the mentality of, I just want to be picked for the team kind of thing, then you're not setting yourself up for success and you're not able to be objective and really truly analyze, well, what about these individual people and what are they going to offer me? What are they going to, like, how are they going to add value to my life? Not just, pick me, pick me. So I think it's important when going into dating one or multiple people to really understand like where you're at in your security and self-esteem. 
Yeah, I think that is so important because I know I spent years dating where I was just in that pick me, pick me mindset. And then it was like, well, why is nobody picking me? And but I never thought to consider like, well, like, who do I want to pick? Yeah, yeah. I, I have several clients over the years who I, I've had several clients over the years and currently who will do role plays and I'll say to them because I'm getting the sense that they have this very pick me mentality and I'll say to them, okay, so you went on this date, reenact it for me. I'm the guy, you're you, like to the best of your ability, rehash the conversations, et cetera, and try to share my observations that their pick me mentality and fears are coming off in the conversation or their body language. And that's not attractive for either, for either party. No one wants to date somebody who's off the bat, super insecure. Yeah. And and showing that, especially early on. And I'm, I'm sure I gave that vibe off many, many times without realizing it. Oh, I for sure Um, did. Yeah. So overall, what do you think, and maybe that is the answer, but um, what do you think the biggest mistake that women are making in dating is? Um, I can't put my finger on one with certainty because I know like the second we stop talking, I'm going to think of something else and be like, I should have said that. But uh, the thing that feels most common of what I'm hearing is (sighs) timeline. And I need to meet someone because I'm always a bridesmaid, never the bride. And I'm all my friends are moving in with their boyfriends or getting engaged or getting married and that being a kick to their self-esteem. So wanting to fix that kick to their self-esteem with a relationship and that's the wrong motivation. That's probably going to lead you to a relationship that isn't the, the foundation isn't a shared, shared core values. Um, so And I hear like when I'm talking to clients who are like in their early twenties, like just out of college or, and they're saying like, everyone's in relationships. Like, like, look, I don't wish ill upon your friends, but like, they're not all going to end in marriages. Like this isn't like some kind of rat race. And I have plenty of where I stand now at just about 33, like, I have plenty of friends who were living with someone or engaged or married and it wasn't the right person. And now they're with the best person. And if you ask their 23, 24 year old self that like, where would you end up? They would not describe the situation there. And now, and that situation is a situation where they're, they're happiest. Totally. I think it's something, you know, my friends and I would always say to each other when we were struggling with being single and, and starting to feel like we were getting up behind, like, just to put us back on track, if we really just wanted a boyfriend, we could, you we could, could find one. a boyfriend. We could have one yeah. tomorrow it's if called we da- wanted. It's called dating down. Yeah. We could find somebody to be with, but that's not going to be the right person. That's not really going to be the type of person we want to be with or the person who you know, fits us and compliments us and we could build a life with. And that it's funny you say that because when you say it like that, it sounds so obvious, but I feel like there's this gray area where people actually do pick people who aren't going to compliment them the best and be the right fit. That It's just not as obvious. It's not like going up to the first person you cross on the street right. and being like, Hey, like date me. Okay, cool. But it's someone who like, as a friend, you know, when you're watching your friends and you're like, you deserve so much better than this. Like, what, what are you doing here? Yeah. And and you know what, that gets tough. Cause I, I have started to see, you know, I'm now I'm in my late twenties. I'm now in the phase where almost all of my friends are engaged, um, or getting married now. And there are definitely people who, from the beginning, I was like, this is not, built to last this is not this is not it they are not it for 
my friend. Um, yeah. but, and that but can they, be tough depending on how your, what your friendship dynamic is. Yeah. Um, and, and to my surprise, they've stayed together. They've gone through the steps. They've gotten engaged. Some are getting married and, um, it has been really tough. And, you know, I, I want them to be happy. That's my priority. Like they're my friend. I want them to be happy, but I do feel protective and nervous and a sense of like, well, I have to look out for them also. And, and do I say this to them because I see it? Cause I've been in relationships before where my friends have had to come to me and say like, Alana, this is not a good situation. We do not like how he treats you. And I pushed them all away because I didn't want to hear it. So it is such a tough situation to be in. Yeah. And I, I've been in relationship where people didn't tell me that because they didn't want to hurt my feelings or whatever, but they just like didn't hang out with me or us yeah. as much. And I look back and I'm like, when that relationship ended, everyone was like, Oh, thank God. I was like, Oh, thank God. Why don't you tell me? Yeah. But like, that's unfair. I understand. But yeah, it, it is difficult. But something that I tell my client, I hear a lot and I tell my clients is like, okay, you're focusing on quantity. Like, oh, like eight friends of mine are just got engaged in the last year or whatever. And they're going, through, as you say, they're going through the motions. They're doing the steps, even if it didn't look like something that was necessarily going to last. And uh, I'll say to them, why don't you spend more time with that couple? Like, you don't know what goes on behind closed doors. You don't know if that's a relationship that you would want. And I actually had several clients recently because post COVID, everyone wants to travel go to like Europe or like out West, whatever destination weddings and not have a plus one and be with other couples in a, in like that whole, like traveling, sharing like hotel breakfast, lunch and dinner together experience and coming back and being like, Oh, I don't want that. And I was like, yeah. yeah. And this is someone who you have, said is better than you because they're in a happy relationship for so long and now up close and personal you're like oh no yep it, it's literally like the concept of instagram versus reality and uh, we make yes. so many assumptions about what other people's relationships look like and we have absolutely no idea what's really happening no idea no obviously we don't wish ill on them like we want them to work out but it's something where when we internalize that as like, well, they did it, they're deserving of love and I'm not, but that you might not actually want what they have. Right. Which I love the memes that are <laughs> uh, Jared Freed in particular of like you up on betches. Um, he, he does this all the time and with like seasonally, he'll be like, it's that time of year where like people are posting like, the apple picking like couples pictures yep, or whatever yep. and he's like he's like the longer the caption or the more like kind of professionally photographed the, the worse they're is, doing the that is a couple in decay yeah. <laughs> and it's it's so accurate be, and it's sad because then I'm sitting there on like kind of the front line having people come to me showing me pictures of the people they're referencing and being like look how happy they are they're in mouth matching flannels and i'm like that's actually probably a bad sign also he was probably really miserable taking that picture and did not want any part of it <laughs> at all yeah. yeah and the fact that you felt like you needed to take that picture to prove to other people that you're happy you know, like, you know, when you're like, forget relationships, just in general, when you're like on vacation with your family or whatever, and you're really in the moment, and then you're like, shit, I didn't take any pictures. That's because you're really happy. happy. You don't need to stage professional or whatever, like portrait mode photographs all the time. If yeah. you do, maybe we should reevaluate that. Absolutely. 100%. Um, okay. I have a bunch of listener questions I want us to cover. But before that, one thing I really wanted to talk to you about was that a lot of my listeners have been reaching out lately that they're struggling with, you know, getting back out there or 
letting themselves trust people again after going through some type of traumatic relationship experience, whether they were lied to or cheated on or manipulated or anything else along those lines. So what, you know, would you suggest to somebody who sometime in the last maybe six months, year, two years, whatever the timeline is, you know, went through something like that, but they do feel like they want to try again now, but they're scared. I, first of all, would say same girl, same been there. Um, and yeah, <laughs> and it's hard and not going to say it's not hard because it's really hard, but I mean, this is so basic and cliche, but one person, one guy is not representative of the next guy. And you could go the route of using a motivational factor of, oh, I don't want to get in my own way. I don't want to project onto this new person who I have no evidence would be unfaithful or not trustworthy. I don't want a worst case scenario would be that would actually be great for me, but I got in my own way. And so that motivational factor can sometimes help take that pause when you're getting anxious or upset or scared to check yourself and where it's coming from and ask yourself, like, contextually, is this relevant? Contextually, is there anything going on that should cause suspicion? Or am I making a generalization here? Um, And it's easier said than done, for sure. But I, I think it's something that is definitely an active practice and not something that you should expect yourself to just turn off and turn on and seamlessly be able to do. Yeah, it takes time. And, and I think, you know, I was actually I was in a recording last night with the Mostly Balanced Girls, uh, me and Carly. And oh, I love them. They're the best. I'm so excited for that episode to come out. Hopefully, I think it'll be out by the time this comes out. So guys, go listen to it after this. But um, <laughs> we were talking about how, you know, I was in a really like traumatic relationship for a bit. And, you know, it was what, like four years ago now, but even maybe five, even when I was dating though, before I met Jake, like every single person, I would just assume like if they weren't, you know, texting me back on a Friday or Saturday night that they were out with another girl because it was a Friday or Saturday night or even a Thursday night because that could be a date night or any night. You know, if I didn't hear back from them, I would instantly assume they were not texting me because they were seeing somebody else. And there were so many things like like, like, watching March Madness with their friends. Or sleeping, like in the shower, literally anything. And, you know, I there would be times even you know, when I first started dating Jake, where like, I would see a hair on his pillow, and I'd be like, is that my hair? Or is that somebody else's which is, hair? Which is hilarious, because I'm looking at you right now, and your hair has multi-tone highlights. Like, I mean, like, <laughs> so it, I don't know. I'm assuming, like, I wouldn't know. <laughs> I'm, right. I'm assuming it's natural. It looks very natural. But like, you have dirty blonde hair. And I, yeah, I could imagine being like, oh, that's blonde hair. I have brown like, hair except that like you don't fully <laughs> but there are some blonde strands like is it mine I don't right. know like oh this one's a little dark right. I would like like literally compare the color <laughs> but right. um, like one step away from a DNA test yeah so it it's something that is really 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 hard to shake and and you know I was saying on the recording last night that for the first six months dating Jake I was just waiting for the other shoe to drop and it was really hard for me to continue to remind myself like, no, everything is really good. And everything is great. And he's open and honest. And he is not this other person or these other people that I've dated. And it it really does take a while. So you have to just be patient with yourself. And yeah, like you said, like, because one guy did something to you doesn't mean every other guy is going to. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I couldn't relate more. My relationship was like, my last relationship was like five years ago and it was toxic and full of lies and betrayal and all of that. And I absolutely carried that into my current relationship when there was 
nothing wrong. Like everything was so good that I even turned that into being like, he must be covering something up. Like who's right. this nice? Who's like, how this could good? it be this good? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But, yeah. But I mean, that's the effect of uh, losing. Uh, betrayal does a number on you. It really does. It really does. All right. Transitioning into some listener questions. I have a few short ones and then I have two longer situations. So the first mm-hmm. one is when you hear your clients talk about their relationships, are there any early signs that a relationship is not going to work out? Yeah. I'd say that with like a heavy heart because it's, it's tough because I'm not a life coach. Like my job as a therapist isn't to point out it very blatantly and be like, run. And sometimes I want to jump, it's all virtual, jump through the screen and shake them and be like, oh, run. But they would not come back to me. And if I truly want to help them, then I need to sit with my own personal discomfort of fear of their feelings being hurt and sprinkle observations and reflect things back to them um, so that they eventually feel empowered enough to come to that decision themselves. Otherwise, what's the point of therapy? Or it's just going to be people throwing assumptions and opinions at people and that's not helpful. But uh, yeah, um, let's see. I mean, communication is the biggest thing that stands out to me. And like, I'm not talking communication, like, oh, you don't answer your phone for a couple hours, kind of like what we were talking about, like they could be in the shower, like relax. Um, But uh, effort wise and openness about emotions and and where they're at, I feel like I hear a lot of clients pulling teeth to know how the other person feels about them. And no one should have to go through that. That's not a healthy relationship from the get-go. That is not a good foundation. And that puts the other person on a pedestal holding all the power. It should be communicated as a two-way street where each of you are at. And if it's avoidant or not communicated for any other reason, there's either a lack of interest or a commitment issue there. And that's not promising. Yeah. And it doesn't Um, feel good to be in that situation where you need to like almost beg them to give you anything, to give you something, to tell them, to tell you how they feel. Yeah. And I think actually the more overarching thing is what you just said is when I see clients who every week or twice a week or whatever, when we speak, they're not feeling good. And like that, like bare minimum, why a relationship should just be a value add. Like if you're coming to me every week and you're saying, but they're this, that, and the third thing that I want on my list and I'm so attracted to them or I think I love them or I really like them or whatever, but you're constantly anxious or you're constantly doubting yourself, you're not completely making that up you're not and I have so many clients who are like it's just me I'm so insecure I'm just I'm gonna do this in any relationship it's not him and they defend the other person and I'm like uh I don't know I feel like there are a lot of things that are contributing to you questioning this and we should listen to that yeah, definitely. And that kind of leads right into the next question that I have. Uh, otherwise, I would continue on this one for like 25 minutes. But <laughs> it really does relate to the next one, which is, do you think relationships should be easy for a certain amount of time? Yeah. I think that a lot of people, my past self included, uh, romanticized things being tough and kind of contorting that into passion and good communication when in reality it's just toxic. And some of that, I, I look, I will 
die on the hill of the notebook and anything Ryan Gosling. But like this, a lot of, I know we talk about Instagram and social media a lot, but if we just think about like TV and movies, a lot of what we're seeing is the struggle and the star-crossed lovers and like really wealthy Rachel McAdams whose parents didn't approve and just like all these obstacles to get to that ending where they're together and then we we cheer for them and we're so happy and I feel like we a lot of people apply that to real life and it's like oh we just we love each other so much and then make excuses like we're just young or we're just whatever and it's like no like the point is to add someone to your life that's fun and you enjoy and you want to talk to yeah and you know in all those movies we see them finally get together and then it ends we don't see what happens next no, they're probably divorced in the credits. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I think that's a really, you know, perfect example of, of why we think things in relationships and dating should be one way when it that's just not how it goes. And, you know, people always ask, like, I mean, me and Jake, like, we really don't fight. And for a while, I was really nervous about that. I was like we need, I was like, what's going to happen? Like, are we just never going to fight? Like, I feel like, isn't fighting supposed to be healthier? Like what's our first fight going to be about? Like, I think I, for a while I was like, our first fight is going to be over the fact that we don't fight because I always brought up how we don't fight. And like, guess what? It's, we're now a year and a half in, like he's moving into my apartment now. And we still like have not had any like big blow up fights and that's okay because we just work together and we listen to each other and we compromise and, you know, it doesn't have to be this big, like, well, you did this and I wanted to do this. And I said this and you didn't listen. It's like, no, it can actually just be easy. And I never really experienced that before. Yeah. And I think the foundation of that is that you respect each other enough to try to find a solution from the get go and make it easy and like it the same thing you're speaking my language in like my relationship now i we i picked fights over the fact that we didn't fight and like yep. actively was trying to get a rise out of him because i was like why don't we fight and he's like cuz we did the what <laughs> and like i like it just if you're committed enough and if you want to resolve something, you do it. And you both have the tolerance and will to hear each other out and you trust each other enough that they're not malicious and they're not trying to hurt you. So therefore, why wouldn't you figure out a way as a team to resolve it? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't have to be hard and and it's allowed to be easy and you should want to find that person that it's easy with. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry for Scott, my boyfriend, when he inevitably listens to this, but, uh, <laughs> but I would say to my friends and sometimes to him, I would be like, maybe we just don't love each other enough. Cause we're not fighting like that. Going back to that passion thing, like maybe this right. isn't, it maybe we're just maybe this isn't it and I was so wrong and he was so steady and able to just be like all right uh, your past is telling you this I'm not telling you this so I'm just gonna ride this out until you get there yeah but yeah and that that could have been a moment where he like was like no like that's ridiculous and you could have actually gotten in a fight over that but instead he was patient and understanding as to why you were saying that and you were able to work through it together yeah emotional it's, maturity it's, it yeah emotional maturity it's a wild yep. concept the fact of yep. team versus you versus me yep precisely all right uh, let's get into one of these longer situations so 
there was a whole in this one, there was a whole like first part of specific dating situations, but I think we can just go skip to the second half where it says, I became a very anxious dater. Being ghosted left me devastated given I wasn't getting very many matches. Talking every day to someone only for the um, them to suddenly stop responding caused me to feel alone and sad. I was getting really overexcited when I did get a date, but I was also becoming extremely anxious and disappointed when communication would suddenly cease after talking every day. I had two examples where girls would arrange a date and a few hours before they would reschedule for the week after during work commitments and then a few hours before the date they had found someone else or decided to get back with their ex i had one date where a woman stood me up when i had messaged her to see if she was still coming she responded with ha 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 so my faith and trust in dating women is now shot i feel like every time i do get a match it's going to suddenly disappear it's also frustrating because i see a girl a lot of girls say on their profile that they want a funny loyal kind guy which is what all my friends think i am but i never get the chance to show anyone that all this has all of this has left me feeling demoralized and dating leaves me feeling like I'm gonna die alone. Okay. Well, first things first. To the woman who responded, ha 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 ha. Who do I have a bone to pick with her? I'm really glad I don't know her name. Um, but I feel for this person. And I also empathize and relate from past very similar feelings. And I had to really sit back and, again, conversations with my father, very analytical, who from a different generation, had no idea about dating apps, and was like, all right, okay, walk me through it, explain to me, w walk me through this, and I showed him my profile, we would swipe together, whole thing, and he's like, all right, so is there a feature here where it shows you the exact day that you matched with someone, and they matched with someone else, and I was like, no, why would they do that? And he's like, so how are you supposed to know that they're not five dates in with someone, but not exclusive, and they go on a first or a second date with you, but inevitably, they're already further along with somebody else. Like, this feels like there should be some kind of marker for that, because otherwise, people are going to feel terrible about themselves, because they think they're all starting at the same uh, block on a racing track. And they're not. There are a lot of handicaps involved here that we're not aware of, and then we just personalize. So, like, I can think of a bunch of people who, in for myself, who I was interested in, and then like didn't hear back from them, or just kind of they would push off dates, and they like just never really materialized after that. And I would pick myself apart and think of the things I said wrong on the first date, or why I whatever fell short for them, why they were too good for me, blah, 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 blah. And then realized like a week later, they, because we followed each other on Instagram or something, they posted a first official couples picture. And I'm like, oh. Yeah. Literally, what's today, Thursday? Last weekend. I, again, because someone I matched with back in the day on Hinge in um, we talked for a little bit. I thought we had good banter and conversation. We didn't even get to the first date. And I was like, that's weird. Like, I feel like we like kind of hit it off talking wise. And a couple weeks later, he posted a picture in Montana, like hiking with a girl who, whatever, also like were similar brands. And I was like, you were about to go on a trip to Montana with someone. And I was thinking that like, we were all in the same wavelength here. And last week, and I watched via 400 stories, their wedding in Italy. And I was like, I was, I was never going to win that race. Like, yeah. and there's nothing about, there's not anything wrong with me. That's the person didn't get the chance to know me because they were already involved in someone. And I think the amount of times that that happens is, a shit ton. I really relate to to what you just said. Also, I love your dad. Like, 
He's great. I, um, yes, love all of Larry. his insights. Yeah, I'm just going to plug Larry on this. Larry, you, you have a new fan Larry, club. Larry, <laughs> yeah, Larry, Larry Weinstein fan club. Great guy. I love it. Um, but that happened to me too. And there's one like really specific example I can remember where I had, it was right after I got out of a breakup. So like, obviously like emotions were super heightened and I met a friend of a friend and, you know, we hit it off, um, at the mutual friends, like birthday thing. And then we ended up going on a date and it kind of started to fizzle after that. Like we talked about going on a second date, but it never really happened. And then not too long, maybe like a month or two after I saw him also like on vacation with a girl. And I was so upset. I sent it to my friend and she's like, Oh my God. Like, yeah, that's like ex friends, best friend. Like they've apparently been like hooking up for years and we're like on and off for years. And I'm like, well, and like, that was she, like my friend was trying to tell me like on, like, it's not like he just went on a date with you and then went on a date with someone else and decided like that person was the person for him. It's like, there was right. so much history here. This was happening way before you existed to him. And there was like nothing that you could have done to get in the way of this. And, you know, it's been like two, three years since then those two are still together, but seeing that was really hard for me and made me feel like, well, clearly like she is enough for him and I'm not like good enough. And, you know, I, I think to your point, like, you never know what where someone else is in their dating journey. Yeah, it's the behind the curtain stuff that we're like, oh, well, everything's equal, all things are equal. So therefore, she was just bet better than me and more worthy to be taken on a vacation after a first date. It's like, no, they've been hooking up for years. Like, yeah, not the exactly. Same. Exactly. All right. Last question. Hi, Alana. I'm 25 and had a tough breakup four months ago and had recently gotten back into dating. My goal for dating this summer is to date different guys for my own self-growth and discovery rather than looking for a boyfriend, which I've never done before. I met this great guy and I really like him as a person. we had been talking for a month before having an amazing first date with intellectual stimulation, emotional connection, and a clear physical attraction. The caveat is that he's moving away within the next year to pursue his PhD and he also got out of a serious relationship in the winter. He's been very clear with me that he needs to be single, but wants to date for his own self-growth. We're both in uninterested in casual sex and are on the same page about this. So at best, we would just date each other throughout the, throughout the summer for companionship and kissing. I'm wondering if I'm being self-destructive by dating a guy where there isn't potential for a future relationship. I'm not looking to change his mind about anything. I want to experience this fling, but am I being emotionally reckless? Is allowing this to continue a low value move or am I overthinking it all? Maybe my masculine energy slash logic is taking over. I'd really appreciate your thoughts on this. That's incredibly self-aware. Um, that was my exact I, I, thought too when first reading this. Yeah. I mean, I love that this is a female writing this. Yes. Not that it matters just so that I use the right pronouns, but yeah. I love, I love that she started by saying, I'm looking to, I just got a breakup. I'm looking to date for my own, like to learn about myself in the context of dating and in general and all of that. Um, but it is interesting to me that when met with someone who expresses the same wants for himself, she's questioning if this is self-destructive for her, as opposed to, is this going to hurt him? Which makes me wonder how much she's really looked into how strong she feels about dating just for the purpose of self-exploring without any longer term goal, because it would only be self-destructive if there was another agenda, if there was a longer term goal, even if it's, it doesn't have to be, it's not like she's not telling you the truth, but maybe she's not as aware of what she would like, or is very aware that, her goals now and what could happen once feelings develop could change her goals. And I think the feelings developed, her thought process could very much change in which case it's definitely a risk worth evaluating um, and communicating and being really open with this guy about like, Hey, yeah, this is where I'm at. This is what I want to, I want to explore, but 
at the same time, I'm realistic that feelings might develop and that might change. How do you feel about that? I think that sounds like something that shouldn't be just held on her shoulders and should be discussed between the two of them. Yeah, I totally agree. And I also think that it sounds like that's a conversation that she would be able to have based on how, you know, self-aware and, and seemingly emotionally mature articulate. this whole yeah, situation is. Yeah, exactly. So I, I agree. I think that, you know, the fact that you recognize that you do think feelings would be involved and that, you know, you're a little afraid to get hurt. Um, yeah, I think expressing that is really smart and seeing how he feels. Um, cause it does seem like you guys are on the same page and understand each other. So it'd be, I think it would be a good thing to, you know, be open about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's also interesting that he's the one going away. I wonder what it would be like if the roles were reversed, just because I feel like there is a mentality of the, the physical aspect of being quote unquote, or, or like convincing you that you're left behind because mm -hmm. you're in that same space where you guys went on dates, kissed, hung out, all of that. And they kind of get the opportunity to start fresh. Right. I don't know. I just, I, I wonder if her mentality would be different if she was the one going away. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like a good question and a good opportunity for, for her to try and put herself in his shoes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, before we end this, my final question for you and my favorite question to ask is what is the best piece of dating advice you've ever gotten? It was more of a scenario than advice, but it was picture a scenario um, where you love yourself and you are someone who respects and loves themselves to the utmost extent. Would you approach dating the same way you're approaching it now? Would you be looking for the same thing you're looking for now? Would your timeline matter as much as it does now or would you be more flexible with it if you truly were loving yourself and respecting yourself what would be different and that helped me a lot because that helped me open my eyes to like I, I don't need to be engaged at this age or married at this age because I don't know what that means for me 10 years after that if I like that feels like I'm trying to prove something or it's not internally motivated it's based on external factors and extrinsic value but if if I really love myself and I view myself as like my friends and I would I when I talk to them about this we talked about like if I was the bachelorette if I just treated dating as I was the bachelorette and everyone had to prove themselves to me and come audition for me what do I want and what am I what do I need who's going to meet that and what am I not willing to accept and not cloud that with the noise of the pick me mentality I love that so much and I, I think that solves for so many issues that we all face internally and so many things that, you know, we put on ourselves and, and all this pressure and all of this, like, oh, well, you know, the three guys I went on dates with, they didn't like me. It's like, well, would you even have wanted any of them? Yeah. 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 I, I have that conversation so many times a week and I honestly think it I should be having that conversation more uh, I, I I don't think people let themselves entertain that enough I love it so much and that's something I've never heard before so thank you for for bringing that up well thank you so much for being here it's been so great I've loved our conversation before we go where can everybody find you your practice are you accepting new patients anything you want to shout out um, that can help people you know find you and get more Hillary <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. I love being on here and finally talking to you um, outside of DM. Um, 
my practice is accepting new patients. Um, it's my initials in every different combination. So my website is hlwtherapy.com, Hillary Leanne Weinstein. My Instagram is hlwtherapy. And my email is hlwtherapy at gmail.com. So when in doubt, it's literally just my name. HLWtherapy at gmail.com. <laughs> HLWtherapy everywhere. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and to everyone listening, thank you for listening. Don't forget to send this to a friend who needs to hear it. There's so much in here that I have like, I have like eight different friends in mind I want to send this to. And I know you guys do too. Send it to the group chat, share it on your story, tag us if you loved it. Don't forget to give a five-star rating and review. And we will see you guys next time.